Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater who strives to optimize every living ecosystem, passionate about looking after this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that dwell among it. I'm really excited to get into today's episode and I just want to thank you all for listening and for all the kind reviews. I've been getting a lot of messages and comments on Instagram, um, sharing a lot of love for the episode on the recent, amazing recent guests that we've had recently and also for the carousels that I've put up there actually. So I spend hours sometimes with just the one Instagram carousel, which is the swipe thing with actual unbiased, gender-free science. So. It's a really good place for you to get your resources, save information, things like fruit and diabetes. I talk about sugar. I talk about climate science, waste management, a whole host of different topics. So definitely flick us a follow on Instagram at plant.paradigm to follow all of that there. Theming on today's podcast episode, which is a lot about politics, I actually had a chat with Phil recently from the Party Pooper podcast. And a lot of what we talked about was actually ethical investing. It's not something I talk about a lot on the show. Um, A lot of the time we obviously stick to nutrition and climate science and and activism and things like that. But ethical investing and where you put your money is actually an extremely important part of the process and also part of the cyclical solution that we need to adopt. So if you guys want to check out my conversation with Phil, I'll leave it linked in the show notes so you guys, if you want to learn more about ethical investing and our conversation kind of stems a bit more around uh, cryptocurrency and things like that as well. But today's conversation is with Laura Rees. Laura is the founder of Agriculture Fairness Alliance, a nonprofit advocating for farmers' use of sustainable practices that halt climate change and lead to a cleaner, healthier, and safer environment and future. She's a sponge of knowledge and has a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering with a business minor and a financial planning certificate. Laura first dipped her toes in the world of charity and altruism in 2014, founding a charity for refugees in Malaysia called RohingyaFund.org. If you're not new to the show, you should know that plant-based diets are generally the way to go for sustainability, but we can't leave the lifeblood of our food dry, that being the farmers. These people have devoted generations to animal agriculture, a now outdated system. We have to put ourselves out there and make the effort to help farmers transition to plant-based agriculture. A lot of this falls on government subsidies. And that's exactly what AFA is there for. And they follow a four-pillar format, which we'll dive into. I think this conversation is incredibly vital because when you're sitting around the dining table with friends and family, I don't know about you, but a big topic for me is, but what about these farmers though? We can't leave them high and dry. And I absolutely agree. So I took good advantage of having Laura on the show and dove deep into this convoluted topic. With that all being said, I'll see you guys on the other side. Laura, welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast. How are you going? Uh, I'm doing all right. How are you, Tom? Very, very good. Thank you. Um, look, Laura, you you work in a field and you're kind of amongst a lot of things that are quite a little bit complicated. What's been on your mind recently about the state of the world? I'm gonna start, I'm gonna just drop the small talk. To that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um... Well, something that's been kind of hitting me very, um, has been hitting me, has been, I I sit in on a lot of meetings like the, the house ag committee and the, the appropriations committee and the Senate ag committee. And, um, I'll watch speeches by politicians and read articles and the book written recently by, Clinton's ag secretary. Um, I didn't read the book. I read an excerpt of the book, but something that's a little bit disheartening is that the way activists are perceived 
by many of the people who are elected into public office is um, they see them as silly. They see them as um, as uh, not to be taken seriously. And that's kind of disheartening, but at the same time, it just validates why we're taking the tack we're taking, which is to go into DC at higher proper lobbyists who are well connected and they already know the insiders and they represent us as serious policy players, um, not as activists. And we go in with legislation proposals and policy proposals that are palatable and politically feasible and easy wins. And as um, the, the president of the Hemp Association would say, put a shiny ball in front of them that they can't help but say, yeah, let me grab that and add it to my agenda, make it really easy for them to say yes. And by doing so, we're no longer seen as activists, even though in our hearts we absolutely are because we recognize all the, maybe not all the things that are going on in the real world, but a lot of things are going wrong in the world. And we see, wait, there's this path that we can take that solves a lot of issues. If people just like shift their diets to plants, <laughs> a lot of problems either go away or they become very manageable. Uh, they, 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 they need to see that. So we're trying to present that in a way that is in, in a mode that they're gonna take seriously. And that's, that's, our, that's, my, <laughs> that's my answer to your question. I find that very, very interesting. Do you think I mean, activists are seen in this kind of light because what is perceived by these politicians or lobbyists, it seems like activists are maybe asking for something that's unrealistic or maybe are the activists not conveying the message properly? Are they just not taking seriously for other reasons or are they kind of posed as a threat so they they don't want to be listened to? Oh, it's a whole mix of things. I mean, it depends on the politician. Any politician who is a, more of an authoritarian mindset, which I think is about half of them, they're going to see anybody calling for change as being a whiny toddler who just needs a little discipline. And so they shouldn't be taken seriously. And in fact, maybe they'll figure out what they need to do if they aren't taken seriously. And the other half who maybe um, agree with some of the things that activists are calling for, they they themselves, perhaps they want to be taken seriously so they don't wanna see, be seen as if they're working with a bunch of activists. And then there's of course the, the money, I mean, follow the money. In America, it's pretty much the wild west in terms of running for office. In California, at one point, there was a, I think it was a proposition put to the voters to have, make it so that the politicians at the state assembly had to wear patches, like a Formula One racing car driver, like patches of their sponsors so that people could see who's paying for them to be there. Yeah. Um, We don't have public funding of elections here, so it's all private funding. So every single politician whether they want to or not they are absolutely beholden to the people who pay for their advertising when they're running for office and they might not think that they owe anybody any favors but you know human nature is human nature and if you want to get reelected you know who's going to pay for that reelection campaign and um so there's there's also the money component and activists aren't funding campaigns usually some are there are some groups who are getting people in congress and those people are really shaking things up but in general the 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 more traditional politicians they're you know they're they're funded by big business so if you're active in anywhere in any area that is even hinting at threatening the income streams of those businesses they're not going to take you seriously yeah it's so fascinating how you know, unfortunately it does come down to the money and, you know, Big Broccoli just doesn't have the funding to, you know, push through these policies that might be for the betterment of the people, the animals or the planet or whatever sector that you're looking for. That's not kind of a bit devilish to the way that the world works. And as a way of background, you're obviously quite versed in this field and you have, you know, you work with and you started this organization called Agriculture Fairness Alliance. Can you give us a rundown of what exactly you guys do and and who you are? 
Sure. I co-founded Agriculture Fairness Alliance with my partner, Connie Spence, my activism partner, Connie Spence. Um, we, we both met because we each independently were taking a good hard look at the USDA subsidies and how they were undermining vegan consumerism or plant-based consumerism. Like we're all, we think we can be politically active by buying the products we believe in and not buying the products that we want to be produced less. Um, and we were both frustrated looking at uh, subsidies and bailouts and realizing that they were supporting um, animal agriculture, whether we were buying those products or not. So um, I started a campaign myself and she started a campaign. And then somebody who was funding both of the campaigns said to both of us, hey, you guys should probably talk. <laughs> so we got together and um, we've been working on this ever since. Um, she's working a lot she's she's bringing up another organization called liberation 360 right now that is more of a traditional nonprofit that educates people and i'm uh running agriculture fairness alliance with which is just a straight ahead lobbying group we hire lobbyists we have them push our agenda in dc simple i love that um what is like through the years what do you think has been some of like the hardest thing working with lobbyists or against these other politicians? What are like some of your big, I guess, challenges or, or setbacks? <laughs> well, we're young. We're not even two years old in yeah. terms of AFA being around. Um, uh, one of our biggest, I would say our biggest challenges is um, in order to get a, a congressional office to want to take on one of our proposals, they have to see it as um, having buy-in from a couple of kingmakers, you could say, in the agriculture, uh, in the ag committees. And they have to see it as not ruffling any feathers among what you might call the barnyard, which is the big animal ag lobby groups. So that kind of narrows what you can do. So you can go in and have an honest conversation about what needs to be done. And they might agree. And they're like, yeah, sorry, I can't do that. Because they just, they're not willing to pick up that fight. They've got a lot of other battles to, to charge. So the challenge is coming up with legislation that is kind of hard to argue against. And that they'd go, okay, yeah, we can do this. Yeah. Well, with regards to like what you guys work with you kind of set aside four pillars that you kind of position as a foundation of what you guys want to represent in legislation and things like that and those four pillars are fair subsidies farmer equity environmental protection and food equity i'd actually right. like to dive into all four, four of them because they're incredibly important and instrumental for change but not only change but sustainable change because we can change anything for a year but for something to have longevity it has to have like some sort of circular system that almost rejuvenates itself and you know i think a good place to start is the fair subsidies because it's something that um is such a big mammoth of a, of a topic and there's lots of different types of subsidies Obviously, with regards to the work you guys do, a lot of the subsidies you're talking about is farmer subsidies and all the different um, brackets with there. I know there's subsidies for waste management and for crop growth and, and uh, regenerative ag and all these different types of levels. Um, I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate and say, why do you think it's not fair that farmers get subsidized? We are not against subsidies. We're not against farm subsidies. We want the subsidies to better match the nutrition recommendations coming out of the very same agency that's paying out the subsidies. We want them to shift to whole food, plant-based foods. Right now, subsidies disproportionately favor uh, livestock feed, animal agriculture, dairy and beef production, chicken production, 
and uh, processed foods. Meanwhile, the very same agency, USDA, puts out nutritional guidelines that say 80 to 100% of your plate should be plants. Well, okay, 50% of the subsidies are going to meat, and a vast majority of the rest are going to grains that typically end up in processed foods. This isn't for um, mung beans and broccoli. This is for corn and soy to be used in ethanol and livestock feed. And the, the subsidies are going directly to dairy farmers and cattle ranchers. And um, yeah, so we're not against subsidies. We think in order for a society to function, you need to have a safety net for the food producers. Absolutely. But how about we shift those subsidies to favor the food producers who are generating the food that we're supposed to be eating for public health reasons? I think that's a really fascinating way to put it. But also what I find really a little bit strange is that the subsidies, you're right, do favor a lot to animal agriculture and the byproducts such as the the, the feed for the livestock and you know it begs the question why like are plant growers and plant farmers are they getting subsidized and why aren't they is growing plants more uh, profitable have you done any research on that topic uh i don't think it's necessarily more profitable i would say the reason why so if you look at the history of the USDA and subsidies, the way I read it is the people who are getting paid are the people who politically organized to influence the farm bill so that they would get paid. The return on investment when you're lobbying in DC is huge. Take a guess, for every dollar a lobbying firm puts, or a a company, say, puts into lobbying in Washington, D.C., how many dollars back do you think they get? My un uneducated guess based on the context is uh, $8. More. How much? What is it? What Two it? orders of magnitude more. So for every dollar you put in, you get between a thousand and two thousand dollars back. So this is the lobbying party trying to pass policy on, hey, we need to subsidize cattle farming this certain amount so then the cattle ranches and the profit from that whole system benefits one to two thousand fold. Exactly. So that seems the benefits... incomprehensible. Like yeah. where does this money is this and when we're talking is this tax payers money essentially funding this whole system? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So lobbying a lobbying group might or an in a company or an industry might put in millions of dollars into lobbying and they'll get billions of dollars back in terms of direct payments, subsidized insurance, um, commodity coverage protections, or even intangibles like reduced regulation, reduced uh less requirements on workers' rights if they're heavily la labor intensive, for example. So when you roll all that up, it's about a thousand to two thousand times. I feel like I'm missing a piece of the puzzle. So when I'm talking to, uh, you know, I've met multiple farmers and I've talked to people who work directly in organi organizations that try to look after these farms and transition to different mo modalities of farming. And they're not really well off. The farmer themselves actually make a decent income to get by, but I've never met or heard of, and this is purely anecdotal, a, a wealthy farmer. Like where does this money sit? Like who becomes like the wealthiest, I guess, or who benefits the most from these legislations passing in their favor? I think you want to stop thinking about them as farmers and thinking of them more as agribusinesses. Those are the ones who benefit from these laws. So you look at like beef packing and four huge uh, or meat packing, four huge agribusinesses control 80% of the meat packing market in the US. So it's heavily monopolized. So these guys aren't 
like small American farmer. These are huge corporations that have cornered the market. They're getting a lot of the benefits. When you look at the small and medium farmer, the interesting thing is actually the the USDA, you know, it's a it's a public agency, a public institution. And um, the volunteers at AFA sometimes will we will call up FSA or NRCS uh, agents and ask a question to find out, like, what's the advice they're giving to farmers? And they're actually really well funded and they're unionized and they they give advice and they bend over backwards to help the small farmers. And if you look at a lot of the legislation that's in the Farm Bill, it's for beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers, small farmers, mid-sized farmers. The problem is that a lot of farmers, they don't know these programs exist. So you see these bills being added to the Farm Bill, like how to outreach to these, these smaller farmers. And it seems to me like a lot of the, the big money programs just don't get to the small farmers, even though the agency kind of, you can tell they want to, um, but the the groups who know how to eke out every last penny from these programs are the big agribusinesses and the big um, farmer groups who hire people who just like go through the policy and they apply for every possible grant that they can possibly win and they win them. Whereas the smaller farmers, I mean, I don't know about you, but me, I hate paperwork. I mean, even if I know there's money I'm going to be retrieving, filing some paperwork. I drag my feet like a toddler before I finally open up the web page and f- fill out all the forms and print it out and sign my name and put it in an envelope and put it in the mailbox or whatever needs to be done. So it's it's a matter of um, if it's not almost like automatic payments going to farmers to help them out you're just going to see the big guys taking the money and the smaller guys. You're going to have some who go in and and get the money they want. You see grants all the time when you look through like uh, the SIG grants or the AFRI grants, you see some grants going to like smaller projects at universities. But um, on the whole, it's the well-organized moneyed interests who know how to do the footwork to collect the money. That's my impression. That's my impression. That's really fascinating because you think like, you know, subsidies and when you say, oh, no, people have got to start, you know, eating more plant-based, inherently at some level, at least I felt that when I first started started going plant-based, it's like I don't want to screw screw this farmer. Like when I'm talking like go eat plants, like I, I feel like I'm screwing over Joe down the street who has his farm and he loves his animals. But in reality, based on the context of this conversation, it seems like, you know, 80% of the time you're actually going against the millionaires and billionaire, billionaires that have monopolized the market and really don't need your money, or at least it needs to be shifted away from this monopolization in a way that we can... I don't know, cut their funding somehow or reach out to the smaller farmers and potentially help them shift and adapt to then not only grow more plants, but become a more profitable family owned business. Yeah, I'd love to level the playing field so that the in the US last year, $53 billion roughly was paid out to agribusinesses and farmers. And I would love to see that money just shifted so that it gets showered on the smaller, you know, pinto bean producers. And I just want them to receive the money almost like a COVID check where just because mm. they've been registered the last year, maybe they, this whatever their yield was in their crops, however their crops came in, if that's registered with the USDA, the USDA doesn't add any additional hoops. They just say, hey, we want to make sure that Americans have access to cheap legumes. So we're going to just shower small and mid-sized producers with a certain calculation of a check. And maybe that's just a, a few thousand dollars, but that could be the difference between them expanding that year or not. Um, that's what I'd like to see. Uh, you know, I... <laughs> 
I go to the grocery store and I buy a pound of lentils, it should cost 30 cents, maybe 60 cents. It costs me $2 and 50 cents for lentils. Mm. It's like, it's like the same price as ground as ground beef. It's, it's really, um, reflective of the fact that those lentil producers aren't getting the subsidies that the cattle ranchers are. Which is so good to, I mean, looking at at it with a different perspective, I actually kind of like, like that because when it does eventually shift, which it will, whether it takes 5, 10, 20 or 50 years, and those subsidies start leaning towards the producers of these bean, nuts, legumes and vegetables and fruits, you're going to see this shift towards a cheaper plant sources of protein and then higher cost of animal-based products and then naturally your consumer market will shift to favor more a plant predominant diet um and so just touching on the back end of the subsidy topic because we have got a few to get through what type of subsidies can be introduced is it something as simple as you know let's lobby to get all these producers of plants and beans and nuts subsidize them and then just simply subsidize the animal industry less? Is it as simple as that? Um, yeah, I mean, for so right now we're working with a wide coalition of volunteers and we're taking a look at what's called the farm bill. It comes around every year. I mean, every five years, sorry, five years, give or take. And there are 12 titles and we're just going title by title and we're saying, okay, how can we shift these toward plants? And a lot of it is as simple as, hey, let's just take this list of commodities that are in program A and let's add on 40 of the top plant based food ingredients, like mostly their legumes and nuts and things like that. And let's just add them to the list of eligible recipients of this farm program. Um, and just by doing that, I think we're going to shift a lot of the, the subsidy payments to plant growers, plant food growers. Yeah, I, I love that. And look, a close, in, in my research, a close relative to, uh, you know, subsidies is farmer equity, I guess, in, in a lot of different ways. Are these pretty much tied together? What exactly do you mean by, you know, equity in this context? So we, in our pillars, we have food equity and farmer equity. And for farmer equity, we're really talking about small and mid-sized farmers uh, being able to compete on a level playing field um, in a market dominated by huge agribusinesses that have really consolidated and cornered the market. So, um, a decade ago or so that happened in the, the poultry market. It's dominated by just a few agribusinesses. And then uh, pigs, um, it's consolidated. Pigs are owned by a few huge families and agribusinesses like Hormel, for example. And then it's happening in dairy. Um, Wisconsin and New York and states like that kind of still have like the old family dairy farms but california oregon it's all huge agribusiness corporations where um the small and medium farmers really can't compete just from economies of scale the usda put out a report a while ago called the changing landscape of dairy i think it was and when you read through the economics of like a ten thousand head count dairy versus a 200 cow dairy there's just the 200 cow dairy is just going to get crushed you they just cannot compete because the the per unit input costs reduce so much for the 10,000 cow dairy now you think about what the conditions must be like on the 10,000 cow dairy and it's it's not nice and it's water intensive and they produce so much manure they have to do all these incredible um conservation measures to deal with all the manure and that's when the taxpayer comes in so rather than having that dairy incur the actual costs of producing all that manure they just apply for an equip uh cost share program where maybe they get a grant and then a loan to deal with the manure and then they use that to expand meanwhile the little guys like 
not filing paperwork and just trying to like dairy in the old fashioned way, making her own market around in her neighborhood, which is, you know, that's hard to do to <laughs> milk cows all day long and then go out and sell your product. Um, it's just really difficult. So for farm equity, it has a lot to do with the co consolidation of all these um, products and how the smaller farmers just can't compete. And then yeah. they band together, but they're going up against some Mammoth. Um, industry groups that ostensibly represent them. And they'll put the small farmer on their advertising campaigns, but really they're protecting the income streams of the agribusinesses. And when they lobby, that's what they're lobbying for. I mean, you bring up a really interesting point. And I think where this could merit a really good discussion is when you kind of look at this maybe farm or group of farms that have like the 200 dairy cows compared to like the thousand, these mammoth industries, agribusiness style, you know, I always, I've been thinking these last couple of months, I wonder if there's a way to stipulate or create some sort of third party NGO, or maybe it's something that the IPCC can come in with, but essentially have this sort of algorithm type program where you look at a farm and you can measure the Obviously, we can measure the CO2 emitted, sequestered, water use, land use, and, you know, have some sort of scoring system to rate the overall sustainability or at least eco impact of this program. And then subsidies are actually distributed based on environmental, let's call them points or percentages. And with a system like that, what I actually have been thinking about, which would be really interesting, is we know that the really intensive ones that might take a lot of water use or produce a lot of manure, these ones will get the least amount of subsidies, which will naturally draw the price up. And we know a lot of the, you know, your lentils, your nuts, your quinoa type of farms will actually sequester more carbon, emit less, and naturally they'll get subsidized more. Have you thought about different systems like this to um, kind of balance out the whole agriculture business? Yeah, well, my opinion is the most effective, as far as I can tell, um, the most effective way to limit, let's just do greenhouse gas emissions, is to put a price on carbon emissions and charge producers for their emissions and have them pass that on to consumers. Well, that's super unpopular. Um, right now, there's a, a coalition in the U.S. called the Farm and Agriculture Alliance, no, Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, FACA. And it's it's all carrots and no sticks. So it's all like, oh, here, let's do like a carbon trading scheme, but you don't have to participate. But if you do, we'll pay you to, you can buy a carbon credit and then you can trade them and um, you read through it and it's just like, this is just allowing polluters to keep polluting and even make money doing it possibly. Um, so there's a lot of proposals going around right now, but the, the real theme of everything that's being discussed is a, it has to be voluntary. B it can't, it can't even hint at blaming food producers or even feed producers. And it has to be, um, painless for them. Well, I mean, that's just living in a fantasy land. Um, I think really the best way to do is something like Norway and, and the fossil fuel industry where countries have established a, a price for like methane emissions. In Norway, you emit a kilogram or a ton of methane, you pay the government $1,300 US. Um, to me, that's what I would propose is you just it's a cost of producing and some food prices are going to go up and others are going to come down. It's just natural. So you don't even need, you wouldn't even need to go through the whole rigmarole of, of classifying certain farms one way or another. You would have to still measure the emissions of each farm, but obviously a hazelnut food forest is going to be a net carbon sink perhaps. Um, so they're, they're, cost is going to be zero for emissions. That's that's my preference. Of course, there's 
Laura's preference and then there's what's actually feasible. So there's something in between and we're trying to bring it uh, a little closer to reality from what the the agriculture producers are proposing right now. But, you know, without us, people like us in D.C. having these conversations with politicians and nudging different pr provisions to be a little more effective, um, they're pretty much lining up stumbling over each other, just saying yes, yes, yes to this FACA um, alliance. And you read through it. And I mean, sure, there's a lot of stuff that's that's great. Like, let's increase um, soil research and let's increase uh, our ability to measure the the carbon content of soil. That's That's all great. Yeah, totally for it. But there's no provisions for um, making sure that heavy greenhouse gas polluters are held to account. There's just none. Yeah, I've got a ton of thoughts about all of that. The last one, most recent one, you mentioned this, this group FACA who are trying to bring in a lot of these legislations. I'm, I love to be quite optimistic about life, but I have, I believe, a healthy level of <laughs> skepticism about that. And the first one being, you know, especially in a lobbying environment such as DC, you know, there. when you bring up a point of, say, let's look into soil, great, phenomenal, because I know exactly what they're going to find, which is regenerative plant agriculture is going to have the best amount of sequestration available. Even better than that is the rewilding of land. That research has been done. But what I'm skeptical of is the fact that they can then look at or they can conduct this kind of trial that says the soil of pig farms is actually amazing. What they won't disclose is when compared to cattle farms. And I'm worried that these industries, especially when it comes to creating legislations, can quite easily manipulate the results that they have found do you like have you thought about ways that you can kind of integrate some sort of I'm not even sure what you would call it some sort of third party oversight over what actually goes on because having on paper just you know let's look at soil research is such a little state like this I'm guessing this legislation or this um, thing that's been put forward is maybe even a hundred page document and with every line it's so intense and such a deep topic. You could almost have a hundred page topic on that line. Like how can we not get buried in all that paperwork, but have a system where naturally there is some sort of onlooker? Like, do you think maybe there needs to be more AFAs out there? There needs to be more NGOs out there looking for this and maybe even, no, I'm not going to say government funded, but I know government gets a lot of money and can fund basically anything, but almost like a people-funded alliance, like an NGO, a plethora of them looking into every single legislation, and that is what is necessary to pass anything. Are you asking how do we get the influence of the special interests out of yes. dictating what this, how that actually plays out, these suggestions? So uh, in the U.S., the first order of business is passing HR1, which is the For the People Act. We just need to get private money and um, and private interest money out of funding our elections. I mean, once once politicians have been freed from the shackles of having to, um, you know, I, I don't want to malign the politicians. I think most people who go into public service, they honestly want to do right by their country, by their countrymen, by the environment, by future generations. They think they're doing they're doing what they need to do. Um, but I think privately they would all say this is ridiculous that I have to fund my campaign from, from private private moneyed interests um if we can cut that tie and publicly fund elections then we'll start getting people into elected office who value um 
unbiased scientific reporting and they'll be willing to look at what those unbiased scientific groups are recommending and pass legislation that's sensible within that context. You look at Canada, they recently came out with their food guidelines and you can argue about their food guidelines is not going far enough, but they said, hey, we're gonna have no industry in influence. We're only going to have uh, highly qualified scientists inform the nutrition recommendations. And guess what? Dairy is no longer a required um, food in the Canada nutritional guidelines. Well, in America, it took Dotsie Bausch from the Olympic team and a whole host of um, plant-based doctors testifying to the nutrition board very publicly and broadcasting that on YouTube at all corners of the universe um, about how it's ridiculous that you're recommending that humans be required to drink milk that's for a baby cow and like listing all the problems with it well that's what had to happen for the, our nutrition recommendations to just say they still recommend three glasses of milk a day but now they've added that it's okay if you replace cow's milk with soy milk that was like a huge win but it, they're still recommending dairy because the dairy industry has their hooks in electing members of Congress to the Ag Committee and in lobbying. So we need to we just need to get public funding of elections. I think then a lot of that stuff will work itself out. Mm. I'm so I was so stoked when they at least just added in soy in there. Um, yeah, obviously, me too. <laughs> you know, it's not the Australian guidelines but you know smaller countries like us you know we're heavily influenced by what countries like the US Canada and a lot of the European Union do so it's important to stay informed and you know I love Canada's one it's a bit some parts are a little bit confusing but the fact that they've pretty much said you know water is the main source of hydration is just mind-blowing to me and I love that um but look the next one I really want to talk about, the next pillar, which is environmental protection. How does that fall into the life of agriculture? And what do you kind of work on in that sector? In animal protection? Environmental protection. Oh, I'm sorry. Environmental protection. Yeah, that's our whole focus. We are, we're very focused on the environment because I think everybody cares about it. Well, most people care about it in their own way <laughs> in their own way um we're very focused on bringing unassailable studies to the attention of lawmakers and saying look this this is a problem and here's legislation that will fix it so but before we so i can talk a little bit about the legislation we are um, shopping around right now. Um, we are lobbying both the USDA and members of Congress to create a pilot program that would help farmers transition from intense polluting uh, products to changing actually what they grow or produce to less intensive products. So typically, so we have farmers who are lobbying with us. We have a couple dairy farmers in Wisconsin lobbying with us. They both have a few hundred cows that they milk and they want to transition to hazelnut farming. And the entire argument we make for, well, half the argument is environmental. So we talk about, like on our website, I have a page, if you go to afa.farm slash Dan, you'll see an analysis of the environmental impact of one dairy farm. And he's emitting 200 tons of methane every year just from his 600 dairy cows. Um, so we bring that to the attention of the members of Congress and we say, look, he transitions to meth to hazelnuts. You don't need to help him install a methane digest to process all the manure year after year, you help them transition and you eliminate all of that methane emissions for every year going forward. So it's, um, 
it's kind of a win-win. And then economically, the, you know, the plant-based um, food market is rising so quickly that, you know, we should let, we should enable these smaller farmers to get in on that action early and not just leave it to the big agribusinesses who can fund little pilot programs to get into plant-based foods and let these farmers actually get into supplying it. So environmental action is a big talking point, but also just the financial health of the farmers is another one. But that's where we're focused the most is environment. You mentioned before, you know, everyone likes to do their part and you didn't really throw the politician or the lobbyist under the bus before. And you referenced referenced them in a way that I found was quite interesting, which you said they were shackled. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, maybe they are doing the best that they at least know how. Like, do you think that these politicians know the implications of maybe what they are lobbying in terms of the environmental impact? Do you think that a bit more education on the grander scale showing, hey, look, exactly what you mentioned, this is the methane emissions or CO2 emissions or nitrous, nitric oxide emissions of this dairy cow farm, do you think educating that to politicians would be quite beneficial? Yeah, I think it depends on the politician. Um, My personal impression is when you're talking to somebody who hasn't, engaged with a topic yet, if you're the first one to anchor certain terms and concepts in their minds, you have them with you going forward, no matter what, you've almost inoculated them against other people. If you're talking to politicians who have been on the ag committee for 20 years, and they've been listening to um, the pork council lobbyists for 20 years, and they've been listening to the egg council for 20 years, and they've been listening to the dairy farmers in America, they're, they're probably not going to hear the arguments quite as much, but it's still worth um, bringing to their attention like a particular farm and a dairy farmer who wants to transition and here's the environmental impact change. One of the things that AFA is doing right now is um, applying for grants to fund a research project that would be totally independent, run by a land grant university Um, we are not going to craft the questions ourselves. We might craft a few questions to answer in the program, but we're going to have the PhD students who run the research program craft most of the program, the questions, and they're going to be, what's the environmental impact and what's the financial impact of transitioning a dairy farm into a hazelnut orchard? So one of the farmers we're working with is really close to this land grant university. And we've been talking to some of the staff about crafting this research. Now, the thing that's really nice is that then once we have that research, we can take it into any member of Congress and they're definitely going to listen to it because it's from a land grant university and they trust. And those land grant universities in the U S are funded heavily by the USDA and the intention is for them to be doing unassailable, unbiased research. Now, whether you could argue like some are probably a little bit skewed by some private money, but um, if we can take, when we take in research like that, I think um, even the most seasoned ag member of Congress will look at that with clear eyes. I mean, not everyone, but the majority. Why is it that you're looking at hazelnuts in particular? Is that just what this farmer happened to transition to, or is there a reason for that? Yeah, there's this big movement in the Midwest to plant hazelnut trees um, because it's a robust crop that uh, is well-suited for the climate and it will um, rebuild soil. Uh, and um, make the waterways healthier because Wisconsin is a heavy agriculture state. And since the days of uh, Nixon, whose ag secretary was Earl Butts, the whole idea was, you know, plant hedgerow to hedgerow, monocrop, use industrial fertilizer, industrial methods, and it's absolutely devastated the landscape. So there's this whole movement there to embrace 
crops that are regenerative for the land. So they, a lot of people there are already thinking in terms of let's change what we grow in order to be in harmony with the land. So we're just tapping into a movement that's already going on. Yeah, I'd love that whole concept of being in harmony with the land and a subsidy I'd like to see a bit more accepted but also widely spread is actually just rewilding the land, actually planting native trees into the land that you own and then some sort of government program funding that because they have to fund national forests really at a council level or at a state level. Why not fund the everyday person who's doing their little bit to rewild their portion of land um, because from the funding that I know is available in Scotland and the UK, it's actually a minuscule amount compared to what they could be doing if they were like raising cattle. In in the US, um, typically in terms of property taxes, um, you get the lowest property tax rates if you stick some cattle on the land and classify it as agriculture. But there's a program in the farm bill at the federal level called the Conservation Resource Program, CRP. And I think they have roughly 45 million acres under contract. Maybe it was maybe it was 23 million acres. It was tens of millions of acres under contract. And they pay per acre for people who own agriculture land to rewild it. They actually do this awesome. and they prioritize acreage that's along waterways that are uh, in danger of runoff from nitrates and other pollutants from industrial agriculture. So we have a lot of land under CRP that was passed under Reagan. Um, so it's been around for a long time and typically the land is enrolled for 15 year periods. Um, but of course the lobbyists get in there and they tweak these programs that are, when they're first created um, with a mind to conservation, they're usually pretty well designed, especially if it's like scientific groups coming up with it. And the CRP program, as far as I can tell, was pretty well designed. There are some issues where somebody might be retiring and instead of selling their land to a new farmer, they enroll it under CRP and it's kind of like a retirement program for them. Um, so it takes some land out of the market and so it can make it harder for beginning farmers. So I've heard that kind of argument against it, but on the whole, it's pretty su successful. Now in um, the 2018 farm bill, as we were going through looking for opportunities for intervention, I noticed that someone got slipped in there that when when CRP contracts come up for renewal, they can be um, renewed and allow cattle grazing and uh, harvesting trees and selling um, lumber. So commercial uses and cattle grazing. Well, that's not rewilding. Mm. All of a sudden now they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to get their CRP payment for taking the land out of commission, but now they want to start also profiting from that land. So that's one of the the points that we're going to be having a conversation on the Hill with various members of Congress about, like, let's strike those two provisions. Another program called the uh, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or EQUIP, it was originally intended for small and medium sized farmers to get very favorable financing, like a combination grant and loan to develop conservation initiatives that might be beyond their financial ability, like a, a catchment or um, any sort of way of keeping nutrients from getting into the river, for example. And, um, then in 2002, a lobbyist got in there and, and convinced Congress to add a little amendment that opened it up for CAFOs. Now CAFOs can access this money to, to install whatever um, manure processing they need to do, whether that's a methane digester to capture the methane, but of course it doesn't capture the other nutrients, which are a problem 
or literally truck it out. Like trucking the manure away from the CAFO is seen as a conservation um, method. So they can get this funding to essentially expand operations. They're already creating too much manure. They are not living in harmony with their land. And they're going to use this ostensibly conservation program and hijack it for expanding operations. So those are two examples where we have programs that I think are pretty good on the whole, but they've just been kind of hijacked over time. Again, by the groups that have the money and the, the means to go in and tweak the law to favor them. This isn't the small farmers. Yeah. I wonder if it'd be um, quite beneficial to just change that 15 to 30 because I feel like nowadays yeah. everyone's got this whole net zero by 2030, net zero by 2050, and 2050 seems to be a really big one. And I know I think it was the UN that actually put something out about agriculture having to be net zero by 2050, and I know a lot of nations, including Australia, have said a lot of this 2050 Yes. So, I mean, I guess a 30 year period and we think about how far we've come in the last 30. So since like 1990, in terms of where we're sitting at now with electric vehicles, with the predominance of, say, a plant based diet or at least a flexitarian diet, which, which reduces an average person's average income, the technology of solar. And I'm thinking in 30 years time, and this is very optimistically, given the trajectory of how we've gone in the last 30, I feel like just that little doubling of years would actually mean that in 30 years, maybe that option of logging or of converting it to cattle land won't be as maybe profitable as it is now. Well, Tom, your wish has been granted because in the 2018 Farm Bill, they added a pilot program called the Clear 30, or yeah, Clear 30, and it's it's to allow people to enroll in 30-year contracts. Oh, I knew, I, see, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to the fourth pillar as we're closing in. I know it's been about an hour. Um, we're looking at food equity. Can you talk to us about what that means? Yeah. Um, for us, the big word is accessibility. Um, you have a lot of groups of so all all our context is in in terms of the us but a lot of marginalized groups live in areas where they don't have access to fresh broccoli fresh even fresh edamame (laughs) fresh greens beans everything um so a big part of the farm bill is the nutrition title, which is gets a lot of food out to places. But there's also provisions about like the supply chain and um, bolstering local marketing networks. So there's a lot of room for lowering the costs to get fresh, healthy food to inner cities, to food deserts, to every American really. Um, So when we're talking about food equity, we're talking about making affordable, healthy food available to everybody. Yeah. And I know you've pulled out like the race card a few times. um, And I know that was disclosed a little bit in what the health, I believe it was, where they they had this African-American family, I believe, living next to a pig farm. Oh, yeah. How how can that issue like be addressed? Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking because um, you get politicians who they win on a platform of being pro business and anti regulations and like we need to slash regulations. Well, the problem is when you slash regulations, some of these agribusinesses like these pork processors. They absolutely target marginalized communities who they perceive as having no economic nor political power. So they'll put pig CAFOs in neighborhoods where it's predominantly uh, Latino, African-American, or Native American. 
And they're thinking as well, they're not going to complain. And when they complain, no one's going to listen to them. And sometimes they're right. Uh, North Carolina is an example. Um, There's a group called the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. And they've done amazing work convincing the state government to continue a moratorium on new CAFOs in the entire state. And that's that's in place right now. But every two years, the industry comes up and and fights it and they have to go in to for to battle it again. Um, And, you know, you have to be pretty obtuse to not see it for being pretty racist where they put these CAFOs. It's it's pretty shameful. Um, My impression is that the USDA is trying really hard to right the many wrongs of the past uh, racist policies and uh, processes at USDA, you know, like um, black farmers who applied for loans wouldn't wouldn't be granted loans, whereas a white farmer would. Um, you had uh, th- that same ag secretary under Nixon, his name was Earl Butts. I mean, the guy retired, well, he, he uh, resigned in shame after telling a joke that managed to be both sexist and racist at the same time. I'm not going to repeat it because it's horrendous, but you, you read the joke and you go, that was the guy setting the tone at the top. I mean, it's no wonder they discriminated against, um, anyone who wasn't white in the seventies. Uh, are you Googling the joke? <laughs> I am out of curiosity because I'd never heard of Earl Butts. It's horrendous. Wanna, is it actually? Oh, he's a character. I, we, we posted on our Facebook feed um, an interview with him in the 80s. And he, he doesn't mince terms. He's like, hey, if we don't produce it, we can't sell it. What's right. meat? It's corn and soy. And so we want to we want to grow as much corn as soy as we can because the world wants to be treated to a special meal and a special meal is meat. So um, like he that was how he set policy. And that's what we're suffering from now. I mean, all the corn and soy, the corn is the number one subsidized product in the U.S. It's ridiculous. Mm. I mean, I find it interesting and just. I guess, tailgating on this whole preface, I wonder if it's the reason that a lot of times when we're looking at people who adopt a plant-based or even like a vegan ethical moral agenda or identity, they're generally females and people of color because, you know, it's so that they, you know, understand oppression a, a little bit better and they can empathize and sympathize with the animals and the suffering that they go through, but also the suffering of, human rights and um all of that so i find it very fascinating that it's kind of full circle we, we see it happening we see it on the tv but we don't make the connection in a lot of times and i wanted to sum up this whole conversation a lot of it seems super daunting and when we're looking at individual change it's pretty simple in a lot of ways just go to your shop and vote with your dollar and purchase products that have a friendly environmental uh, footprint, that they're fair trade, that don't abuse human rights or any of these different levels of rights. But we're talking at a political level, something that I would say is probably the hardest thing to change. You know, in your sector, what do you think would be the easiest thing to improve on? So what we're looking at is um, just getting a simple pilot program to help farmers transition. Because if we can help farmers have a path to transition, then we can lobby for all sorts of uh, subsidies to shift to what they transition to. That's the first step. Um, Next, it's the farm bill. And I got to say, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of stuff we can lobby for that's not obvious. I mean, it just takes reading boring legislation and pseudocode for legislation and identifying programs and going, oh, you know what, if we just nudge it in X, Y, Z direction, 
it's going to end up shift naturally shifting the the payments to plants. So that's like the easiest thing for us to do right now. It, it's I I don't see that anybody's maybe someone's done this before. I, I don't know. I don't want to say nobody has done this before. But um, taking sort of an overall comprehensive look at the farm bill with a wide coalition of people who are like minded. And uh, what we're doing is we're simply going through and identifying what I'm calling opportunities for intervention, OFIs. We don't have to pursue them. We just want to document them. And the goal is to have between 50 and 100 of these. And then we will per- prioritize them based on feasibility and impact. And the ones that are the most feasible and we think will have the most impact, we will lobby for in the farm bill. And these are probably going to be things that are, are low hanging fruit. Like it's not, it's going to be hard for anybody to say, no, don't do that. Cause we're just saying, Hey, add this one group as an eligible entity to a program or add a provision that requires X amount go to human grade plants or something like that. It definitely sounds like some easy opportunities that you can take advantage of or not I don't want to say easy because I'm sure overall it's no it's I'm definitely just, not <laughs> the opposition you get <laughs> to, to what you think is just like a very easy ask it's like whoa but it just it's it, what it does is reveal that these lawmakers are beholden to their donors it's just the fact and it sucks I mean, I it, it makes me as an American citizen. This is not the country I was sold on in elementary, middle and high mm. school. This is not what I was taught what America was all about. And it, it pisses me off. <laughs> I was literally going <laughs> to gonna segue to, to how do you are you quite hopeful of the future? Or are you, how, like it's so easy. Um, I'm sure any of us who are quite educated on the politics and the way that the world kind of spins in its obscure ways. How do you not lose faith in humanity? Do you do you have to meditate three hours a day? Like, what's your what do you do? So there, there's a um, there are stages of grief, right? And you go through the grief of realizing how. Um, of the trajectory humanity is on. And I'm on the other side of that grief. I've gone through it. So at on the other side of it is acceptance. And I suppose I could um, just do nothing because it seems hopeless <laughs> and just enjoy my life and, you know, go for my walks and my bike rides and visit my folks, which I do that. Um, I could take the tack of uh, William Catton Jr. who wrote the book Overshoot. And he wrote this in the 80s. And he was like, look, it's Ecology 101. We are already in overshoot. Politicians do not have the wherewithal to do what needs to be done to correct the overshoot. Don't blame anyone because we're all just, we're just an organism on a planet who is um, consuming more than it can sustain itself with. So we are going to hit a collapse. Um, And that's just the fact. So once you go through all the stages of grief of realizing that, then it's like, okay, well, I can't just sit by and do nothing. I have to do everything I can to at least make that collapse um, less harsh because I want the next generation to have a habitable planet. And the only way they have a chance of that is if we all act right now and lessen that collapse. And the only way to do that is to stop emitting greenhouse gases, stop polluting our waterways and start living in harmony with our land. And we have to do it sooner rather than later. Um, The collapse is gonna happen. We are so way beyond our means right now. Um, But I mean, my hope is that we lessen the collapse to the point where the next generation, um, I mean, even in my lifetime, uh, that it's a little more (laughs) 
comfortable than it otherwise would be. Sorry, yeah. is that too negative? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I kind of get caught in that whole, um, I guess, concept when you look at like the IPCC's little prediction that well, at this stage we'd have maybe seven years left before this climate catastrophe becomes irreversible if we continue as business as usual. And it gets to a point where it gets a little bit overwhelming. And I want to finish off with your thoughts, actually. You know, I'll leave all the links to connect with you guys. And, you know, if someone wants to get involved, I'm sure they can reach out to you or AFA or they want to volunteer or they want to help get involved or donate with their time or with their wallets, whatever that um, means that they want to help you with is. But I wanted to give you the platform to speak your mind on anything that has that you've been thinking about maybe today over the course of this conversation or maybe in the last year or so. It has to it could be relevant to this conversation or completely, completely random, favorite favorite TV show or anything. The uh the stage is yours. Uh wow, well that's very open-ended. Well, first I would say I'm really impressed with some of the activism going on in Australia right now. Um, like Emma Hurst. You guys can yeah. collect more people like her. Um, I've I've talked with like Alex Vince of Animal Liberation. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, animalliberation.org. Uh, uh, I would say support them. Um, get politically active for... I'm often asked what can an individual do to get politically active. Locally, what I would do is wherever you live, check out your count if in America, I'm not sure if this applies to your country, but um, in America, check out your county. Usually property taxes are assessed and collected at the county level. Um, go to your county level website read about how they assess property and what rates they give to agriculture property and what rates they give to rewilded property. And if you could go to your, um, the county clerk and just ask, how do I get involved to make sure that rewilded land gets at least as low a rate as agriculture land, if not lower, and go talk to um, the, the people in power who have been elected to the county seats and ask if they'll um, put in some provisions so that rewilded land uh, gets taxed at a rate that's at least as favorable as agricultural land. I would say bring with you some studies like you were talking about Tom earlier that kind of demonstrate that rewilded land is more carbon sequestering than agriculture, like prairie land with cows on it. Um, bring in some data, maybe that's specific to your area. Make sure that you choose a data source that's unassailable and unbiased so that they're not gonna go, oh, you know, Greenpeace or whatever. Um, I mean, Greenpeace does some good work, I'm sure, but, you know, some people might be biased against yeah. it and, and just do some local lobbying to get the property tax rates right so that somebody who buys property doesn't go, oh, I'll stick a few cows on here to get a lower tax rate. You know, like um, one of the people on our board is Renee King Sonnen from Rancher Advocacy Program. And I was talking with her husband one time with Renee and um I asked him about the whole property rates down there. And he said, yeah, in Texas, if you don't have cows on your land, you pay four to 10 times as much for your land in property taxes every year. So you stick a couple cows on there and you get the lower rate. Well, that's, that's not going to, that's not giving people the right incentives. So I would say at a local level, that's a great place to start. If you want to like try out lobbying, otherwise go, if there's any, um, there's Green Mondays, you could look at Green <clears throat> Green Mondays, which is a program uh, developed by an activist at Family Farm Action Coalition. And that's a great way to get your feet wet going to the city council and um, 
and pitching a program that's easy for them to say yes to, getting to know your local officials, uh, going to coffee, just make yourself known, you know, in a nice way where they like you, not where you're annoying. Um, engage like that. I would say go to your first city council meeting and don't say anything. Just listen, try to uncover, understand what each member cares about. And then at some point, um, pitch a program. Uh, where I live, there's a group called Plant-Based Advocates, and they do a lot of work like that. So I would say locally, that's a great way to get engaged. Um, of course, I would say go to Agriculture Fairness Alliance and become a member for $10 a month because we're we're gunning to hire another lobbyist by the end of the summer. But we really, I mean, it takes money. It just takes money. And we hire lobbyists who are well-connected. Like our lobbyist knows very well the staffer, some key staffers where um, there's no way we would have the conversations we're having right now without him just having those relationships. It's just, and that costs money. Um, don't get me wrong. I think he's a great guy too. I like our lobbyist a lot, um, but he costs money. So yeah, join AFA. 100% of donations go to lobbying. Um, and you can even sign up for as little as a buck a month if you want, just to be part of the group. Um, we'd love to have you. And then um, lastly, I would say get active. Share, if you're in America, talk to people about HR1, which is For the People Act. And especially if you're in a district with uh, representatives or senators or in a state with senators who haven't signed on to it, contact them and tell them that they need to support it if they want your vote in the future and get your friends to do the same. Because in order to make my job a lot easier in DC, uh, where I can make an argument based on science and be heard, HR1 or the equivalent needs to be passed. It's for the People Act and it, it's I wouldn't say it's perfect legislation, but it's a step in the right direction and it gets a lot of money out of politics and it gives candidates a chance to win who aren't funded by industries. All of those. That's what uh, I'm about. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. And, you know, it's all very wise advice. And, you know, I wanted to finish up with a thank you. Um, you know, obviously, thank you for the time that you've taken out of your day to have this really important conversation that I think everyone should share around, especially because there's a lot of tips for the US specific uh, market and what you guys can do over there. But for anyone around the world, I think there's uh, translations in which you can um, take the advice into your council or your jurisdiction or your state. And I really want to thank you for the amount of time that you've taken out of your day to really run AFA and vote and put your time and energy to better our planet and to better our health and to better the I guess the treatment of animals it doesn't go unappreciated and we definitely need more people like yourself out there and you know in the in the midst of things especially in the political world which is a as we discussed an incredibly hard field to tap into and really conquer so I really appreciate all your work you're putting in there. It's it's 100% not going unnoticed. And, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting and talking with you. And um, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me on, Tom. This has been an absolute joy to speak with you. Welcome to the other side. Thank you once again to Laura for coming on and having this super impactful conversation. I definitely learned a lot and I think what we talk about here is so complicated and has so many branches to different areas. I think having more conversations like these will actually lead to seeds and thoughts and ideas in entrepreneurs and philanthropists being planted to actually help instill change. Let me know what you took away from this conversation on Instagram at plant.paradigm. Of course, I'll leave all the links to AFA and to connect with Laura in the show notes below. Definitely give them a follow. And if you're in a position to, I think donating would be an amazing help to the cause. And while you're out there supporting things, why not support the podcast by leaving us a review on Apple iTunes. Every review helps a lot. Even just clicking that five star without saying anything or writing some nice words would be really, really nice. 
that is all from me today. I will see you in the next episode. Eat plants, stay happy. Peace.